Stream, stimmt das? Ja. Ja. Is that the question? Ja? Um, you understand German? No. No? You might think of, okay. I can, not easy, I can shift to English. I could theoretically stuck to the manuscript, then it would be a brilliant lecture in academic sense. But uh, on the other hand side, I have so many images to show you that this never matches with my, let's say, uh, endorphin guided bodily language. Uh, I want, first of all, to tell the prehistory of the project. I was, of course, as typical Austrian middle class kid, very often in former Yugoslavian holidays, which we called Yugoslavia, although we had always been to the Croatian part of it, to the closest one, of course. And as I've read recently, some of the YouTube videos that I googled, uh, it was considered to be the paradise of Earth on Earth. And we as kids, of course, and even my grandmother didn't care what happened behind the scenes. So we used to go with Reisebüro Gruber, which is a typical Graz travel agency, to wherever Reisebüro Gruber would have taken us. And my parents were very happy to get rid of the kids. We were sent to Graz to grandma. Grandma was taking cousins and, uh, of all kind into the bus and went to some bungalows where we had a great time. And then grandmother was walking alongside from the bungalows to the best beach where there was always the best hotel and introduced us to this nice interior which we found very strange at that period of time. And we also found it very strange that grandma used to hang around at the bar, which she never ever did in Austria, and had some weird long drinks and behaved like a Hollywood movie star or some French Yugoslav German post-war film productions to be somehow you know, treated by others as the, as the star. The stuff was very smart, also, you know, hosting my grandma as being some sort of star. And we got as much ice cream as possible, which we also never got in Austria. So that, it was really a very different experience. Later on, I studied architecture, and then we made our typical architect's field trips, of course, also to Italy. But you get everything for half the price in the northern part of East, in Istria, for example. You get Roman excavations, you get uh, early Christian churches, you get uh, Venetian, Venetian architecture, and you get some modernist architecture of a sort of quality that we all never ever experienced here. And many of that older generation architects were very jealous about what has, has been built there at that specific period of time, which would have never ever been commissioned here to that degree, or at, at least in very small scale in comparison to what happened in so-called uh, Yugoslavia. And then when the Hippo crisis got into its peak and had been nationalized in 2009, I, of course, we all got curious again what happens there. So my first approach was not about the history of architecture, but about the history of prioritization and what the Austrian players are going to do there. It turned out that many of my architects' friends were planning big resource for people who did not yet, got, got, uh, didn't, did not yet have ownership there. For example, in Porridge, there was the idea that the Catholic Church would get all the land res re restituted and then develop it from scratch, for example. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, the Catholic Church didn't get anything restituted. Mm -hmm. And it, they're still the same players in the game, but owned by the, some other Austrian company, which was proudly pronounced in Austrian media, Epic Valamar, the biggest player in tourism in Croatia, which nobody knew in Austria as being ever, ever having dealt with tourism. So that's how I got into the, got interested again, and then we were desperately trying to gain some funding, and luckily uh, in Styrian culture, in the cultural department of the local provincial government of Styria, there had been some little fund available for our, let's say, neo-colonial research, revisiting the places that once belonged to us and uh, uh, going to belong to us again, or are already in our ownership, not in our private ownership, but in the ownership of our banks. And some of the banks are owned by ourselves, involuntarily. And so that's how we started. So I started to retravel the, the trips that I did in my childhood and when we did our, when I studied architecture. Uh, but we want, from the very beginning, we wanted to have a comparative aspect. So we decided that friends of mine who live in Berlin, to research about Bulgaria, where they spent their childhood. We uh, had been on holiday trips, meeting the East German relatives at the Black Sea coast. 
And so they were visiting a place they knew while I was visiting the other place. And I hired some partners for my research. One is Maroe Marwirsch, who is an architectural historian or journalist from Zagreb. And they co-author with, with Vladimir Kulic of, of two books. One was called uh, Modernism in Between. And the first one was called Unfinished Modernization, which was, the which was a contribution to the uh, European Capital of Culture of Maribor. Mm. So it was a European Union funded project, a uh, sort of reconciliation project for scholars of all parts of former Yugoslavia that should work together. Actually, they didn't work together because each scholar made a research about his own new nation, mm -hmm. including the Croats, which made a research on Croatia only. And interestingly, the Croatian team was focusing on tourism architecture, but uh, with a very weird narration, uh, I consider it a bit weird, of genuine Croatian modernist style in contrast to the others, mm -hmm. and uh, with some argumentation of evil turbo capitalism that destroys, uh, let's say, the, 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 the romantic gaze of what we ne that they never explained because it was a sort of highly political exhibition without any, mentioning any name, any, any notions of politics. So, and then I was arguing that this is, this is, this is absolutely absurd. There is no, nothing like turbo capitalism. There are specific figures, we all know them, that, you know, made some kickback payments and, and more or less privatized the country into their own hands, or as I figured out recently, they privatized the jewels of the country but they privatized them to people that they knew they might be able to control. Mm -hmm. And so it turned out that this is not, this is so far from any liberal privatization process than, any, that, than you could expect in contrast to what all my, not only, you know, also my Serbian friends who called, oh, evil tuber capitalism, everything is destroyed. So, so all of them would argue the same. And also, Scopi today, this is not turbo capitalism because the, no capitalist would, you know, make this project. This is a state directed uh, project, of course. And the same, the same happening in, in Croatia also, the Croatians very smartly camouflaged it as a liberalization, economic liberalization. And so this was the booklet we made, and I can hand it around, comparing Bulgarian and Croatian, in that case Croatian, not Yugoslav, because at that period of time, my Croatian partner didn't want to be connected too deeply with Yugoslavia. Yeah? for whatever argument ever. I, I, I wanted to convince him we could, you know, for us, that, yeah, you know, you're Austrian, you can say whatever you want, but I'm Croat working at the university in a very stif specific situation. If I want to make any career, uh, we should skip this notion. Interestingly, he was also a bit embarrassed that we compared his Croatia with Bulgaria, you know, the, the poor uh, Orthodox communist country. But for us, it was very, let's say, enlightening to see what a, let's say, the, the, the apprentice of, 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 of Soviet communism, Bulgaria, uh, realized at the same period of time and how in both countries the privatization project went in a very different uh, of direction, with a different, had different, very different aspects. And then I also made an exhibition about the Croatian part, which we then politically incorrect called one time Yugoslav, then Croatian, depending on where it happened and which had been the partners. So typically also an opportunist, you know, if, if the sponsor wants to call it Croatia, we don't care, we know what it is, you know. If the sponsor wants to call it, there's no sponsor who <laughs> calls it Yugoslavia, despite of probably Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, we can only call it Yugoslavia. Anyway, this exhibition happened in 2012 in the House of Architecture in Graz. And during my research and the following excursions into the field with buses full of scholars from the field of architecture, most of them very good friends, uh, to the hotels and ruins in former Yugoslavia, I figured out that something is missing in my research because my partners at the, for the book had been serious architecture historians. I couldn't go too deeply into the, let's say, the political con confusion mm -hmm. and into what I loved so much is the interior, the mundane interior and design and art within the hotels, which was totally outstanding from our own Austrian perception. So currently, um, I've created this exhibition, which is in a gallery nearby, I can give these flies around. Tonight we will have a talk with Maroe and 
Natasha and Sasha, which are new left Croatian activists fighting for saving and rehabilitating the heritage of non-aligned and self-managed Yugoslavia on Croatian territory, at least rhetor rhetorically. And tomorrow we will have a film night in Forum Stadtpark, where we will see some old commercial movies, how they praise the hotels at that period of time, and also some artists' productions about the hotels. And for some of you, also depends on how many people will come and how long they stay. There are some nice, let's say, mainstream, half mainstream, half art house movies from Serbia of the period of time uh, dealing with sexual liberation in tourism resource in nudist camps close to the mountains of Montenegro, which I think some of you might know anyway. So to the uh, current presentation, uh, there's a sub headline for the first chapter, the third ways of planning and privatization with a question mark, because this is a reference to Vladimir Kulic and Maroye, who argued in, the, in their one book that it is a distinct, different development during the socialist period, uh, which one can discuss because the outcome from the point of view of architectural history is exactly the same as everywhere else in coastal territories of the same period of time. So there's nothing distinct in at the Croatian Adriatic coast, of course not distinct to Montenegro. It's made a bit distinct to, to Slovenia, which has a strong Italian influence. But if you would go to the southern Sardinia, for example, Sicily, where the landscape is close, is more similar than in some parts of southern Dalmatia, then the tourist architecture is exactly the same. So one of the aspects is that, of course, but I wanted to start differently, I want to start with a post-war period of time. Well, let's say start with some argument that Igor Tukarini had uh, mentioned in this book, The Sunny Side of Yugoslavia, that it was published somehow here in the wider realm of Slavic Studies Institute. Uh, that is especially in Tito's Yugoslavia, the role of tourism was more crucial than in other places of the world. For one hand side, as it was mentioned in social tourism, which is not my issue today, that's Iga Duda's special issue, that domestic tourism and social tourism at that period of time was first of all a tool of reconciliation of a population that had fought each other before. This argument is interestingly also repeated by the French, it was also mentioned by the French government after the Second World War, that they will build coastal camps. And even Club Mediterranean founders were using the same argument that let's you know, leave all, all the symbols and burden of evil civilization and mingle and meet almost naked in this plain, simple you know, structure of the Club Mediterranean to learn to love each other and to learn to produce a community from scratch. So they didn't read Agamben or something like that, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, from the suffering of the civil war in France, they were arguing that we need sort of camps for teaching ourselves how to communicate in a new uh, civilized way, and the same arguments were reproduced in uh, socialist Yugoslavia as well. Mm -hmm. The second was, of course, and that is stressed by uh, Igor in the text, that because of the third way politics and because of being in between the blocks and not necessarily respected on both sides the way they wish to, Yugoslavia administration were arguing that the hotels are showcases, uh, tourism in general, uh, and, the, and later the hotels are showcases to show off the success of third way. And especially after founding the Nomadland movement, hotels also are showcases to show the international partners which were all brought to the hotels to be photographed, of course, like everywhere else in the world as well. And interestingly, for, the, for Tito mentioned this in 1951 already, according to Igor, but in 1951 there hadn't been any new hotel in, at, the, at the Yugoslav Adriatic. Uh, in 1951, the hotels were starting to be built at around 1960, before it was everything was dedicated to social tourism and the holiday camps for the local population, uh, for workers' unions, companies, uh, subsidized holidays in camping compounds or agglomerations of bungalows in the pine forest. But interestingly, 
there was a Yugoslav German co-production address, German tourists already in 1954, using this poster. And I don't know, you know if you're familiar with German Heimatfilm or Austrian Heimatfilm. After the Second World War, there was a period of time when, we, when our film productions produced super romantic comedies, or partly comedies, partly trash. Uh, where well, the main goal of all the participants is to marry each other at the end of the one and a half hour movie. And they were early, let's say, location placement movies, but also product placement movies, that some of the actors had also been singers, Schlager singers, that promoted their songs via the films. And on the other hand side, the location was promoted as a tourist attraction. We had several of them, a rather modest one, and later in the 60s, we got these very weird uh, Swedish sex bombs meeting your old movies. So there was a sort of sexual liberation even within our Heimat film movies. And interestingly, this German movie was an official co production, was of enormous importance. This gang of German people went to Opatia, or to Istria and Opatia, uh, of course, fishing for girls. And I will show the title song. Actually, I will play the title song. censored in Yugoslavia, so it was never ever played there, it was uh, touring around all the German cinemas and Austrian cinemas, but because the administration argued that this is a misrepresentation of our society, you know, we don't consist only of, you know, uh, folklore girls having sex with German musicians, but we are on the way of modernization, and therefore this film should not be shown, you know, in our country. But interestingly, as you all know, uh, there's a lot of Schlager music from former Yugoslavia as well. And in the most of the tourist uh, representations, even of that period of time, uh, Yugoslavia is represented as this sort of authentic, you know, place where you can make some romantic, authentic form of holidays without any new architecture and super modern experience. What is modern genuinely is hanging around naked at the beach is considered by many scholars in tourism studies as the utmost modern experience. And interestingly, this is a prospectus of the same period of time, 59. You see, Istria, there's basically you have a lot of semi-naked people in the, in the water represented but no modern architecture. So it's about the history, there's a traditional history of, 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 of the environment and, and the leisure activities with one obscure piece in here that might be an early part of some monument that was mingled into the tourism prospectus. In the <coughs> As mentioned before, the first years were dedicated to social tourism uh, facilities and interestingly within these social tourism facilities there have been some early masterpieces of modern art realized especially for army holiday camps. Uh, this is the children tuberculosis uh, sanatorium that was the actual purpose in Kravica in made of Makaska, originally designed in 61, but realized in 64. For you, that doesn't mean much, but for architects, that means a lot, because in between had been the earthquake, the heavy earthquake of Skopje, that radically changed the building policy all over former Yugoslavia, but also in Turkey, and all these territories which were endangered by further earthquakes. So what had been a very elegant modern architecture before became a very solid, bold, 
concrete construction afterwards. And since then, the buildings are so perfectly produced in concrete that it's almost impossible to tear them down nowadays. Uh, the, 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 these children holiday resort consists of this sort of UFO-like uh, structure where the children used to sleep and they have a playground on top, they have a second playground here before they can escape to the seaside at several thresholds. But interestingly what we learned only later is that this uh, project stopped to be used for social purposes already in 1970. So in 1970 the army handed it over to some Bosnian company to run it as a commercial ho ho holiday resort and use the pine forest around it as a camping site. And interestingly, of course, if it comes to so-called privatization today, it is a bit confusing because the Bosnian company claims ownership. All the nations that formerly had been Yugoslavia claim ownership because it was their army. And it's also located on the border <coughs> of two villages or communities. So nobody knows actually whom this thing mm -hmm. belongs. Therefore, it's a ruin since today. This is another one from the very early hotels in superb modernist style in Kupari, also used by the Yugoslav People's Army. And the only hotels, they say the only buildings built for commercial tourism, had been so called motels or guest houses. They built motel style hotels, but did not yet call them hotel because hotel would be too close to the former ideological uh, period. But after, well, but the more they got on, to, on the political, international political stage, the more there was a demand for international style hotels in Yugoslavia. And interestingly, if you read Igor's text, this sounds like it's the same argumentation. So Tito asks, asks Ask for, come and see the truth in Yugoslavia and we built you the modernism in front of your nose as monuments of representation. But when Tito said the thing, he mostly referred to the visa regulations of the country, come to see the truth because you can come and then they built the hotels. And this Hotel Ambassador is the, let's say, the most typical symbol of modernization, uh, of course, planned before open in 65, that means it was planned before the earthquake. And it was, of course, planned after several trips, both of managers, of self-managed companies, how should a modern hotel look like, and of study trips of the architects, and, of course, of the trips of the Tito administration around the world, in which hotels they were hosted by other statesmen. In that period of time, there was some important role model that was Hilton International Hotels. Uh, I will speak about that tonight in more detail, but very short. It is not only Yugoslavia where the hotel is of importance for the state representation, it, it had also been for the United States and for the new allies all over the world after the Second World War. So in 1959, the first international Hilton was built in Costa Rica, then it was built in Tel Aviv, in Istanbul, in Ankara, in uh, Iran, in all that countries which were endangered by communism. Mm -hmm. And Hilton never invested any shilling into the hotels themselves. Hilton was making an offer, or let's say the other way, the American CIA was making an offer. Do you want to have Hilton? Mm -hmm. Now give us a piece of land for free, finance the hotel and we will come and put the Hilton logo there and we'll offer you the fruits of the free world. And actually Hilton Hotels has been the state representation seats, for example, for the for Reza Bakhlevi, for example, who became dictator with the help of the Americans, and he, more, he had his palace, but he loved much more to hang around in the Hilton to present himself. Mm -hmm. And one can easily see, can easily imagine you know, Tito watching uh, Reza Bakhlevi on TV with his weird uniform and sunglasses in this fancy hotel with his black American jazz music, musicians and wanted to have some same sort of style of representation back home, which was realized, for example, in Ambassador, and the name is the program. So this is the new embassy of the new modern lifestyle of uh, Croatia. So you have everything one needed, and a very nice mundane uh, lobby with the staff playing guests, because in all the photographs, they see people 
uh, showing up and later when I had made an interview there, they told me they all know them. So it's my <laughs> grandfather, you know. And interestingly, in this hotel was showing the best art of then Yugoslavia, but of course this election was uh, already following the new, let's say, uh, federalistic tendencies. It was showing basically Croatian artists, despite of one, which is Dusan Javonia, who is a Macedonian, but who settled down in Istria and became somehow Croatian. This is the sky bar of the hotel on the 10th floor, having this enormous size abstract expressionist painting by Edo Murtic that caused a conflict at that period of time because the other artists, the friends of the architect, were asking to, to remove this painting because they th thought it's not genuinely, genuinely Croatian. Because Murtic had a grant of the United States already in 53 and came back with this style of painting which the other Croatian artists considered to be, cro to be American. And indeed, abstract expressionism is, as we learn later, the, the, the style of art that was mostly supported by the CIA agents uh, for, for giving evidence about the liberal, the liberal attitude of the Americans towards art. If Hitler hates abstract art and Stalin hates abstract art, we have to love it. <laughs> they convinced their own president against his wish you know, to love this kind of art. And I, I, I think from all the, all the details I know about Tito's private text, that it was the same with Tito, you know, if, if modern art is anti-fascist and anti-Stalinist, why not go for it? But if you see photographs how Tito furnished his own private apartment, it looks absolutely the opposite. This is another art from the same period of time, because it's not the same style everywhere. Uh, and this is the most famous architect of the period of time, Brunsenzaf Richter, who had built the World Expo Pavilion in Brussels, and he had been really an international superstar of architecture. On the other hand side, he was the partner of this architect. And interestingly, this architect, after, ha after having made several official Yugoslav pavilions and having made a superb career, became dedicated all his life to tourism architecture, while his much more famous partner, Richter, stopped his career as an architect and dedicated all his life to, to art. But this piece of art that had been shown in Graz several times consists of aluminium tubes, and you can move them like this, so it's a permanent moving structure if you activate it, an interactive structure. And he considered this to be a model of modern urbanism, architecture, and art. So it's the symbol of the synthesis of art and architecture. And that is especially interesting, again, from an international point of view. This is not uniquely Croatian. In end of 40s, the SIAM uh, Congress of Modern Architects, which is a sort of stakeholder gang, elitist group of architects where not anybody could join, were claiming that modernism in the old style is dead, so functional modernism is boring and dead, and that the claim for uh, a new poesis or poetics in architecture by a synthesis of art and architecture. And interestingly, especially in former Yugoslavia, this this call for the synthesis of art and architecture was taken very seriously. This is, for example, when his friend Bregovac makes a hotel, he takes the hotel room as an element that puts it to the front and to the back. This is when in, uh, when in Opatia, one architect gets really crazy from my point of view, but he, I called it, I called it the, the, the Rococo of late modern brutalism. So, Every person I bring to this hotel is completely astonished who the hell paid for all this work. But of course, Hotel Adriatic II was, de was dedicated to be the new conference hotel in Opatia. It had a very large conference hall that interestingly uh, was twisted. So this is the hillside, this is the seaside. And at the end of the conference, one could open the curtain of this protection wall, and all the 500 people could see the seaside. Which again, you know, it's like, they are all in Opatia anyway, they know that they're at the seaside, you know. <laughs> but at the end of a five hour conference, when it's dark anyway, you know, uh, it opens and probably have, have light and boats outside. 